when we say leadership, most of the time any kind of leadership training is spent on learning to manage situations, people, money, property. Yes, all this is important but how could you… essentially a leader means you must be able to manage a few thousand people or in other words, you're trying to manage a few thousand minds. But if you're incapable of managing this one, this mind, how will you manage that mind? Just by chance. When you're managing situations by chance, you will be always freaked. Anxiety and leadership has become synonymous today because you're managing people by chance. If you cannot manage this one, managing that one is definitely by chance. So one of the most significant aspects of leadership has been generally ignored or people have acquired this out of their own natural capabilities. That reminds me, uh, you know, uh, you definitely heard of Andrew Carnegie. When Carnegie was multiplying his wealth at a tremendous pace, uh, the United States governments of that day couldn't figure out how is he making so much money. So they set up an investigation because they thought something improper is happening here. When they looked through his business and they found nothing wrong, then they called him for an inquiry. This is, how are you managing to make so much money and we don't find anything wrong with your business? So Carnegie said, I can keep my mind focused for five minutes at a stretch. This was a group of congressmen who were sitting, you know, conducting the inquiry. Can any of you do this? And they tried an experiment. None of them could stay on anything for more than ten seconds. Then he said, uh, you should not be running United States. Because if you do not know how to manage this one, managing the rest is always going to be accidental. When you do things accidentally, being anxious is very natural. And today we have enough medical evidence to prove that if you are not in a very pleasant state of mind, then your body and your mind will never function at its optimal level. There is substantial medical evidence towards this. Only when you are very peaceful and blissful, your body and your mind works at its best. And your success in this world is just this. To what extent can you harness the capabilities of this physical body and this mind? That's all success is. It doesn't matter what is the nature of your activity, that's all it is. Is it so? And the most fundamental and the basic requirement to make your body and mind work properly, sensibly, in the highest possible way is that if you sit here, you must be in a state of pleasantness within here. If I ask you the simple question, how many of you in these many years of living have had a twenty-four hour stretch, that is one single full day where you did not have a single moment of irritation, agitation, anger, anxiety, stress, nothing. You just passed through it blissfully. How many? Very few people can say yes to this, not just here, in the whole world unfortunately. In all these years of living, not even a single day happened the way you want it, not outside, within yourself. 
if your body and your mind took instructions from you, how would you keep it, pleasant or unpleasant? Let me know your choices. How would you keep it? For yourself I am saying, I am not talking about your neighbor. You may have other intentions for him, but for this one, pleasantness, isn't it so? Yes or no? So if one twenty-four hours did not pass in utter pleasantness, obviously your body and your mind are not taking instructions from you. Any instrument is truly useful to you only if it takes instructions from you, isn't it? Right now I am using this microphone, this public address, it's very useful to me because it's amplifying whatever I say. Suppose it starts saying its own things, I better not be here, isn't it? Yes? Your mind and your body should do what you want it to do. And if it is doing what you want it to do, I am one hundred percent sure you will keep yourself in utmost blissfulness. Can I trust you on this? Hmm? Can I trust you on this one thing? That if your mind was taking instructions from you, you would keep yourself blissful every moment of your life. If that's not happening, obviously it's not taking instructions. And there is enough scientific evidence to prove today that only when you are blissful, your mind and body does their best. I would say most human beings are functioning at fifteen to twenty percent of their natural capabilities. If only if they could sit here in a sustained levels of pleasantness, you would see within a… for one week, if you simply sit here, simply blissful, in one week you would be hundred or two hundred percent more intelligent and sharp than the way you are right now. I'll assure you this, I can prove this to you if you give me that one week. <laughs> one week you just stay simply pleasant and wonderful. I think these days you are trying to do that by taking a vacation, isn't it? <laughs> yes? Have you noticed? You went out and you had a good time and you were pleasant and you came back, you seemed to function so much better. But if vacation is the only pleasant time in our life, obviously we are not going to be very productive, <laughs> isn't it? If we do not know how to wake, make our work hours very pleasant, we obviously are not going to be very pleasant or very productive in our lives. So as there is a science and technology to create external well-being, there is a whole science and technology to create inner well-being. This is what we are offering as inner engineering. This could be offered in a million different ways. It is just that as we have paid so much attention to learn our way through the world, we need to spend a little bit of time to find a way through this one. The better you know this mechanism, the better you can use it, that's for sure, isn't it? That's true with anything. Whether you are using a computer or a cell phone or a car, the more you know about it, the better you can use it, isn't it so? So definitely that's true with this one too. The more you know about this, the better you can use it. But how much time have we spent with this? When I say this, I am not talking about you going and reading a book on psychology or on your physiology, no. What you call as my body and what you call as my mind, both these things you acquired over a period of time. When you were born, you came with such a small body, isn't it? Slowly you accumulated this. What you accumulate can be yours, can never be you, yes? I am not disputing whether it's yours or not for now. But what you accumulate can be yours, can it be you? Whatever you accumulate can be yours but can never become you, isn't it? If you start thinking yourself to be something other than what you really are, 
There are bad medical terms for this, I will not go into that. Two cows were grazing upon an English meadow, they were English cows. And one of the cows said, what is your opinion on the mad cow disease? The other said, I don't care a hoot, as anyway I am just a helicopter. Okay. <laughs> if you think yourself to be something other than what you are, there are bad words for that, I won't use such things upon you. But it's very, very, very important, especially people who are in positions of power, positions of responsibility, that every action, every thought, every emotion that you generate has impact on many lives around you. When you are in such a position, it's extremely, extremely important that this one is in a state of utter pleasantness and well-being, isn't it so? Hmm? If your life was just your own nonsense, it's up to you. Once you say, I'm a leader in some place, Everything that you do, the way you think, the way you feel, the way you act has impact on a few thousand lives. When that is so, it becomes of paramount importance that you take care of this one in a completely different way, not just being physically healthy, much, much more than that. Right now, unfortunately, most people's well-being is so fragile, just about anybody can hijack it. You went out today and somebody told you, you are the most wonderful person in the world and you were floating on cloud. What number? Nine? You do only nine? In South India we do eleven, you know. <laughs> you were floating on whatever number cloud and you came home and people at home told you who you really are. It's a very fragile well-being, isn't it so? Just anybody can hijack it, just anybody. It doesn't take some earth-shaking event to hijack your well-being, please see. Anything can stress you, anything can make you anxious, anything ma can make you disturbed, anything can make you lose your sense of joy and peace. Now, in this state, your ability to use your ability to manifest the capability of who you are is not at a very high level. Unfortunately today, most people when they use the word human, they're always using the word human as a bundle of limitations. If someone says, oh, I'm only human, he is not referring to the possibilities of being human. He is not referring to the immensity of being human, he is only referring to the limitations of being human. Isn't it so? Yes? When someone says, I am only human, he is only talking about his limitations. These limitations have become significant, mainly because of the kind of identities that one takes on and above all, because even this one is not happening the way you want him to be. See, in your life, nobody happens hundred percent the way you want them, isn't it so? Has anybody happened in your life? Your parents, your friends, your spouse, your children, none of them happen hundred percent the way you want them. These days not even your dog, he does his own thing. Has anybody happened hundred percent the way you want them? Or are you such a hopeless romantic, you're still hoping that somebody will happen a hundred percent the way you want them? Nobody will happen. They'll happen to some extent. If they happen fifty-one percent the way you want them, you are doing great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes or no? If people are happening… Uh, people around you in your life are happening fifty-one percent the way you want them to be, that means you're doing great, your steak is good. <laughs> So nobody happens the way you want them to be. It doesn't matter, that's not the real problem. The problem is this one is not happening the way you want him to be. 
Nobody happens, it's okay. This one person must happen the way you want him to be, isn't it so? Yes? If this one doesn't happen, it's a lost case. If this one did happen the way you want him, I am sure you would keep him in the highest level of pleasantness and well-being. And that is a sure way of ensuring that who you are finds full expression in your life. Then when you say, I'm human, you will refer to, refer to the immensity of being human, not to the limitations of being human. It is just that when it comes to the outside, we have understood there was a time, do you… whenever you get onto your plane today, do you tell prayers? You still do? What airline are you getting into? <laughs> Not anymore, isn't it? You just go, that's yeah, it, because you know the airplane is well taken care of, the pilot is well trained and everything that needs to be done has been done and the chances of you crashing are one in a million. Isn't it so? The chances of you getting killed crossing a street is much more than crashing your plane. So, no, you just go and sit, nobody thinks of God. There was a time if people had to get into an airplane, they would pray ten times before they got in because they were not sure whether they are going to land or not. Technology, isn't it so? Yes or no? Technology. So right now your trust in technology has way outstripped your trust in God. Please say this. Yes or no? <laughs> yes or no? Is anybody still trying the carpet? No. Somebody was just asking me now, I said, right now I flew on a silk carpet and came from India. You know? It's funny why they named an air airplane <laughs> silk. <laughs> It is just that there was a time when you believed that you could do stupid things and tell a prayer and everything will be okay. Now you understand, unless you do the right things, right things will not happen to you. Yes or no? Are you clear about this? Unless you do the right things, right things will not happen to you on the outside. Why is that not true with inside? Unless you do the right things, right things will not happen to you. It's as simple as that. If right things are not happening to you, obviously you are not doing the right things. So there is a whole technology as to how to conduct the interiority. And fortunately we have tried to ignore that and try to live. So wherever we have done the right things, those things have worked for us. Whatever things we have not handled well is not working for us, isn't it? Yes or no? Isn't that so? So, if your interiority is uh, a turmoil, when I say a turmoil, not always that you are continuously freaked out about something. If your experience of the day is not immensely pleasant, that means you are in a steady state of turmoil. Because only when you are very, very pleasant, everything works well. Seventy percent of the ailment on the planet will disappear if people were just simply blissful and happy. This I am not saying offhand, there is substantial scientific evidence to prove this. So whether we have become medically sick or not, one way or the other, if we are causing unpleasantness, we are sick. If we are causing unpleasantness to this one, we are sick. If I cause unpleasantness to you, you think I am sick, isn't it so? Yes? If I simply cause unpleasantness to you every day, won't you think I am sick? So if I am causing it to this one, am I not sick? Maybe nobody is complaining but it is a kind of sickness, isn't it? So this needs to be approached as a science too. It is very, very important the inner well-being also has to be approached in a scientific way 
and it has been done this way for thousands of years, but it's always been so, just a small segment of people made use of this. But it's my interest that people like you, who are in many ways going to impact many, many lives around you, also should make use of this because your life is no more about yourself. Once you have taken a position of responsibility, once you have taken a position of power, your life is no more about yourself. Everything that you do has something to do with somebody. Every thought, every emotion, every action has something to do with somebody, isn't it? So, uh, just to be for a brief a time to do anything more, but if you have questions, any kind of question, we will look at it. Any kind of question. Hello, I'm uh, J.P. Melash. I'm an uh, MPA student at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, you emphasized in your presentation the need to be uh, at peace with ourselves or being relatively happy. Uh, however, does, do we not need to be uh, sometimes angry or sometimes uh, uncomfortable with our surroundings in order to have the drive to change the things that we want to change? I did not say you should be at peace with yourself or you should be happy. I'm just asking what's your choice? What is your choice for yourself? Pleasantness or unpleasantness? Yes, what's your choice? What is your choice for yourself? Pleasantness or unpleasantness? Pleasantness, isn't it? So that is not my choice. If you like unpleasantness, do it. I have no problem. But if you want pleasantness and you're creating unpleasantness, obviously you're not going where you want to go, isn't it? So I am not advising people be peaceful, be joyful. It's their choice if somebody enjoys misery, what's my problem? Yes, I really have no problem. But there is no such thing, everybody wants pleasantness in his life, isn't it so? You want nice pleasantness inside and pleasantness outside, that's what you want, isn't it? Whatever you may be seeking, see please understand this, whether you go to the temple, whether you go to the bar or you go to the office or you want to go to heaven, you are still seeking pleasantness, isn't it so? Yes or no? Somebody thinks it's in success, somebody thinks it is in the bottle, somebody thinks it's in heaven, somebody thinks it's in the temple, but everybody is in search of pleasantness, is that so? Is that so? So if pleasantness is what you are seeking and if you are creating the reverse of that, uh, you cannot say you are successful. Yes? If pleasantness is what you are seeking and you are achieving the reverse of that, could you say you are successful? If unpleasantness is what you are seeking, that's fine with me, you are successful. <laughs> so this is not my idea. Please get that out of your mind. This is not my idea that you must be happy, I have no such intentions. My intention is just this, let whatever you want happen to you. Hmm? What you want should happen, isn't it? If you like misery and I impose happiness on you, is it going to be good? It's not going to be good, <laughs> isn't it? So this is your choice. So if your choice is pleasantness, why is it not happening? That's a question. Now. Unless you are angry, you cannot propel yourself into action. Unfortunately, this is true with a lot of people that unless they are angry, they cannot propel themselves into action. You heard of Che Guevara? Hmm? You heard of Che? You must be seeing those t-shirts. Everybody is wearing Che Guevara's t-shirts. Most of the young people don't know who, they, who he is. They think he's a rock star. <laughs> But I heard that the, the one t-shirt which is still being sold to the maximum on the planet is Che Guevara's t-shirt, even today. I see anywhere, any part of the world I go, young people are wearing Che's. Many times I stop them and ask, do you know who this guy is? They said, we don't know. Then why are we wearing? He's Che <laughs> So Che, you know, when I was young, Che was like, a cult hero and Che said, if you are in rage, if you are in rage, you are one of us. 
So this impressed me because uh, wherever I saw injustice, wherever I saw something not going okay, I was also in a rage about everything. Then it took a certain amount of experience and inner exploration for me to see and get out of that rage. Then a group of revolutionaries uh, from, you know, the Jawaharlal Nehru University came to me and they were all Che people and they said, Che said this. I said, listen, now I have something to say. If you are out of rage, you are one of us. <laughs> Now you can propel yourself with rage. You can also propel yourself with your joy, with your love, with your compassion, which will be more saner way of doing things. When you propel yourself with rage, you will cause one injustice for another injustice that's been happening till now. But if you propel yourself with compassion, you will do just what is needed, nothing more, nothing less. See, I don't even want to impose joy upon you. I want what you want to happen. Yes, this is how it should be, isn't it? Because I am not propelled by my rage, I am completely out of rage. Nothing puts me in rage anymore. It's not that I am oblivious to the nonsense that's happening on the planet. I am very, very aware of it. I am very, very involved in seeing and finding solutions. So these are the two ways. Do you want to drive yourself consciously or unconsciously? This is the question. Whenever you are in rage, whenever you are angry, are you conscious or unconscious? You are definitely unconscious, isn't it? And when you become angry, generally you suffer more than your victim most of the time. Yes or no? So in that kind of condition, what are you going to create? Once in a way corrective measures may happen because somebody is angry, but that is not the way to do things. In a balanced, sane way, you can correct things, isn't it? The reason why the first injustice has happened also is because somebody is in rage and you are trying to correct it with another rage. Let's say a crime happens on the street. Out of greed or anger, something, a crime happens. Now you get angry and try to correct it. You are also committing another crime, probably a larger one usually. You can correct that out of simple, sheer sense, out of your humanity. Just now, uh, you know, like about six days ago, I was speaking to a group of people and they introduced me as humanitarian. I said, what's this? I have heard of vegetarians, non-vegetarians and what is this humanitarian? What are you trying to say? No, no, you are doing lot of humane activity. I said, it's a shame that we have to teach human beings to be human. Isn't it so? We are making an effort to teach human beings to be human as if they were some monkeys. If you try to teach a monkey to do what a human being can do, that's an achievement. <laughs> you teach a human being to be like a human being, this is not an achievement. But right now in this world it looks that way, because lot of people have taken on different positions. Because they have become Indians, they have become Pakistanis, they have become Singaporeans, they have become Hindus, they have become Muslims. You have to look for a human being, where are they? Very hard to find them <laughs> If you just sat here as a human being, to resonate with other life around you would be very, very natural. If you get identified with something that you are not, then it all gets narrowed down. Some things will happen, yes, you can fight a war, hmm? you can do certain things, you can do certain things forcefully, yes. But if you want true well-being in the world, first thing is you have to resonate here as life because you are life, isn't it? I don't have to teach you that you are life. You are life. If you resonate and throb as life, you will know how to be a wonderful piece of life which you are. But right now we are trying to find patch, patchy ways of doing things. Simply because somebody did something in anger and it worked at a certain time, that doesn't mean that's the way to correct everything, isn't it so?
It's unfortunate if a human being cannot be propelled into action out of his love, out of his joy, out of his compassion. You tell me one thing, on a certain day you are unhappy and angry, on another day you are very happy. Which day are you willing to be more active? Hmm? When you are joyful, you are ready for endless amount of activity, isn't it so? It works. Yes. Uh, sir, question? Yes, sir, please introduce yourself. If you can take the microphone, please. My name is Ram Gupta. Sadhguru, my question is, intellectually and logically we understand, but practically we find lot of uh, gaps. Can, can we get some tips from your in, inner <laughs> engineering on how to go about it? Okay. Shall we do a simple experiment? Are you okay? Simple experiment? The guinea or these are days of the flu. So anyway, we'll experiment. I want you to sit with your spine erect hmm? and your legs uncrossed. What you do is you keep your… the five fingers of your hand together. Place it gently placed upon your thigh, gently. Do not press down, very gently place. Don't do it yet, I'll tell you what to do but do not do it yet. We will do this with our eyes closed. With your eyes closed, holding your hand this way, you just breathe slightly deeper than normal. And as you're doing this, I will say switch. When I say switch, the hand this is this way, just slowly turn it over without breaking the rhythm of your breathing. Again when I say switch, get it back into this position. In these two positions, something about your breath will change. The way the air fills up into your lung or the maximum expansion and contraction, something about it will alter itself. I want you to notice what's happening. Please hold your five fingers together, gently placed upon the thigh, eyes closed. Unless your spine is erect and eyes closed, you will not notice it. Just breathe slightly deeper than normal, just inhalation, exhalation a few times. Switch. Switch again. Please, please open your eyes. Do you notice some change in your breath? Can someone say what? When it's this way, where is the maximum expansion? Could you notice that? Hmm? Where is this? It's deeper in one of Okay. What's happening, I will tell you. Just do one breath and you will notice this. When you hold the palm facing down, the maximum expansion and contraction is in the lower lobe of the lung, so you notice it in the diaphragm region. If you turn this around, it is shifting to the middle lobe of the lung, so you notice it higher up in the chest. Just take one breath and see, you will notice this. Is that so? Just turning your hand over, the very way you breathe is altering itself. This is not just about the breath. The very fundamental life energies in the system are altering itself just because you turn your hand over. How many times in a day unconsciously are you Now you keep on doing this, now you are setting your energies into your turmoil and hoping to be peaceful. Life doesn't work like that. This is like you got into your car, you don't know what these two pedals are, you just kick any one of them whenever you feel like it. You know what a jerky driver you will be. Right now your well-being is very jerky, please see this. It is not that you do not know peace, it is not that you do not know joy, it is not that you do not know blissfulness. The problem is it's not sustainable, isn't it? Isn't it so? This is like… Are you okay for a joke? You're a very serious question but… Huh? 
On a certain day, this happened in Michigan, an old timer decided to go ice fishing. You know, this is one of the things in Michigan because almost five months it is snowing and the Great Lakes freeze and uh, people go sit on it, cut a hole and fish because there's still water beneath the ice sheet. So an old timer went fishing. When you go fishing, it's not a, mm, totally about, solely about fish. So he took a can of beer, sat there. The cans got empty he, through the day. He spent and sat at nine at ten in the morning. So almost four o'clock, the crate got empty. He was a little dizzy, but no fish in the basket. Then at four in the evening, a boy from the downtown area with a big boombox on his shoulders with blaring rap music came driving like that. Came, sat close by, cut a hole and sat down, fishing. The old timer looked at him. No fool like a young fool. I'm sitting here for the whole day, quietly fishing, not a single fish. The fool comes in the evening, the sun is about to set and with this blaring music, is he going to catch fish? No fool like a young fool. You know, the young people think the other way around but <laughs> <laughs> Then within ten minutes to his amazement, the boy caught a big trout. He looked. Then he dismissed, okay, a flash in the pan, nonsense and he focused on his fishing. In another ten minutes the boy landed one more trout. Now he couldn't ignore him. He sat there watching the boy. The boy was listening to blaring music, jiving and like this. And in another ten minutes he caught one more trout. Now he couldn't ignore this anymore. He kept his pride aside, slowly walked up to the boy and asked, See, I have been sitting here since morning. I haven't landed a single fish. You just came, in thirty minutes you got three. What is the secret? The boy turned down the music a bit and said, Roo ra ra ra, roo ra ra ruff. He said, What? The boy again repeated, Roo ra ra ra, roo ra ra ruff. He said, I don't understand. He said, Wait. And then he spat out a blob of something into his hands and said, you have to keep the worms warm. <laughs> Unless you do the right things, the right things will not happen to you. <laughs> so, uh, because the, the, the technology is subjective, it's about you. See, if it was about something else, I would have written a book and given it to you. Because this is about you. You are the object and you are the subject. So here, it needs a different level of focus. Right now, your whole focus is outward in the sense. Right now, your… the way you perceive life is through five sense organs. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. This is the way you know life, isn't it so? If these five faculties shut down, you will have no experience of life. For example, Right now, if you dozed off a bit, that's not instruction. If you dozed off a bit, suddenly in your experience, I will disappear, for sure. Everybody around you will disappear and you will also disappear. Isn't it so? You fell asleep for a moment, the world disappeared and you also disappeared. Everything is going on, but in your experience, everything is gone simply because the five sense organs have shut down. So these five sense organs are the basis of your experience right now and they are essentially outward bound. You can see what is around you. You can't roll your eyeballs inward and scan yourself. You can hear that. So much activity in this body, you cannot hear that. Even something as small as an ant crawls upon this, you can feel it. So much blood flowing. Can you feel it? In the very nature of things, your sense organs are outward bound. 
But the basis of your experience, the seat of your experience, the source of your experience is within you. Right now, do you see me, sir? Do you see me? Hmm? Where am I? Tell me. You must point it out. Where am I? Ah, you got it wrong. You know I'm a mystic. <laughs> see, right now this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina. Don't you know the whole story? Where do you see me right now? Where do you see me? Within you, isn't it? Where do you hear me right now? Within you. Where have you seen the whole world? Within you. Have you ever experienced anything outside of yourself? The light and darkness has happened within you. Your joy and misery has happened within you. Your agony and ecstasy can only happen within you. You have never experienced anything outside of yourself. Your pain and pleasure has happened within you, isn't it so? So your whole experience is within but your five sense organs are outward bound. So, if you have to turn this inward a little bit, if you have to have an inner faculty to focus on the inward nature of who you are, it takes a different level of focus. Everything, these five sense organs are very essential for your survival, so they get turned on when you're born. But if you want to do anything beyond survival, it takes a little bit of striving. Otherwise, it will not come to you, isn't it? Anything beyond survival, it takes a bit of striving, otherwise it won't happen. So this inner striving has not happened, that's all. I would say, if you are willing to give twenty-eight to thirty hours of focused time, we can turn on a different level of perception which is very inward. That's all it takes. Twenty-eight to thirty hours of committed focused time. We usually format this in three days, four days according to people's convenience but essentially that's how much time it takes for you to have a simple mechanism to activate a perception which is not outward, which is inward. Once you know what is happening within you, once you are conscious of how it is functioning within you, I am sure you will create pleasantness for yourself. I trust you on that. I'm uh, Murad, uh, um, studying here at LKY School of Public Policy. I was um, uh, just wondering about one concept that you mentioned, that the body and mind get accumulated over time and they are acquired. So they are essentially different from who we are. And uh, I wanted uh, sort of this to compare with a saying of uh, Descartes that said that cogito ergo sum, meaning I think, therefore I am, which is a uh, human being is a thinker as and such. <laughs> And I was wondering how the mind would be different from who we are. And you also said that we are life. Uh, could you cast some light upon that? Thank you. See, uh, Descartes said, I think so, I am or I exist. I'm asking you, okay? From your own intelligence you tell me, is it because you exist you can think or because you can think you exist. Hmm? Please tell me, what is true for you? Because you exist, you can think or because you think you exist? Oh, because you exist, you can think, isn't it so? Right now your, your thought process has become so compulsive, it's a mental diarrhea. <laughs> it's on all the time. So you think it's a non-stop thing, it is not so. If I sit in one place, if I shut myself up and sit, four days, five days, I don't have a single thought in my mind. Because thought is an activity, isn't it? Any activity, if you wish it must happen, if you do not wish it should not happen, isn't it so? If you're in a compulsive state of activity and you think that's your nature, oh, that's a sad thing. Descartes is a poor man. I know, famous, what to do? 
Now, it is not that I said so. See, don't accuse me of such things. I did not say this. You tell me, when you were born, were you of the same size as you are right now? No. Slowly you gathered this. What you call as my body is actually just a heap of food that you've eaten, isn't it so? <laughs> not a pleasant way to describe you, but <laughs> it is just a heap of food that you've eaten or a piece of this planet, isn't it? Yes or no? Your body is an accumulation, is that so? Hmm? Is that so? The content of your mind is also an accumulation, is that so? So all I said, asked you was, what you accumulate, it can be yours, I am not disputing it as yet, but it cannot be you. It's like this, I am sitting here right now and I suddenly pick up this glass and say, this is my glass. Then you'll think, okay, Sadhguru has a problem, but it's okay, let's listen. People say he is wise, let's listen. After some time, I say, this is me. Then you'll say, let's go. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> now, this is a serious problem. <laughs> this is my glass, itself is a problem. Now if I say this is me, this is a serious problem. You don't want to be here. The food appeared on your plate, you said this is my food, you ate it and now you say it's me. <laughs> this is a very serious problem. You need to address it. <laughs> I didn't create this problem. You've been living with this problem for a long time. I feel it's time you resolve this. If you don't resolve this one problem, you are an endless problem. If you resolve this one problem, there is no other problem in life. There is only one problem in life, that's you. If you solve this, then there is no other problem, just situations. Some we can handle, some we cannot handle, that's all. Um, Sadhguru, I uh, also was wondering uh, about some of the the work that you had been doing as a, as a karma yogi, as I, as I mentioned about rural rejuvenation and uh, Project Green Hands. And uh, I think uh, in the LKY school, we were very interested in knowing um, what motivated you to get into that. And if you could uh, just tell us particularly, like why did you think about reforestation as an activity um, that you wanted to take up? In the year 1998, some experts from United Nations came to South India and they made a study and they declared by 2025, Tamil Nadu, which is the state where I come from, they said uh, sixty percent of Tamil Nadu will be a desert by 2025. I don't like these predictions. I don't like any kind of predictions because a prediction means you are not valuing the human beings who live there. If I tell you this is what you will be after ten years, that means I don't value the potential of who you are, isn't it? Based on present figures and statistics, I am making a projection. You are not valuing what is beating in people's hearts, what is churning up in people's minds, you are not thinking about that. So this is a land. Tamil Nadu is a place, South India is a place where there are many farmers who take four crops in a year from the same land, nowhere else on the planet. You know, wherever I go, any part of the world I travel in, first thing I look at is what is their agriculture. They told me you have none here, but that's a smart thing <laughs> So first thing I see is how do they make their food? Because that is essentially what's going to, you know, long term that's all that really matters. How do people make their food is a very important aspect. So, Tamil farmers have been taking four crops in a year, nowhere else in the planet, such a thing. Ingenious they are, with almost uh, absolutely obsolete and non-existent infrastructure, okay? No infrastructure, simply man and land, 
pulling out four crops from the land is not a simple thing. They are quite ingenious. Now this land which have sustained us for thousands of generations, now is going to become a desert in a single generation. I didn't like the idea. So I've just uh, drove around Tamil Nadu really looking at these people, just alarmist or is it real? Then I saw it is much more real than their figures. I didn't think it will go to… my own estimation did not look like it will go up to 2025. It looked like it's going to happen much faster because in those fifteen years that I had noticed the area, four perennial rivers had gone dry. In Coimbatore city where we come from, I know very well sixty to seventy-five feet we were striking water with the tube wells. Now they're going fourteen hundred feet. And the whole areas are just going dry. People are actually leaving their villages where they've lived for generations and going away somewhere else. So when I saw this, okay, what can we do? Changing government policies, reversing global, global warming, all these things are not in our hands right now because it depends on so many aspects. One of the simplest things that you can do is put the green cover back. So I saw that Tamil Nadu's green cover was sixteen percent and the nation, national aspiration is thirty-three percent. So we just made a simple calculation, what does it take to make it thirty-three percent? Then we saw if we plant one hundred and fourteen million trees in about six to eight years' time, in fifteen years' time we'll have thirty-three percent green cover. So we started this moment in nineteen ninety-eight. I started planting trees in people's minds. It took six to eight years. That's the most difficult place, you don't know. Now in the last five years, we've been transplanting this from people's head to the land, okay? <laughs> we planted little over fourteen million trees in the last four and a half years and Tamil Nadu is the only place in the whole of Asia in the last thirty years where the green cover actually has gone up. So official figures are today, this January, the government announced that the green cover has gone up by 4.2 percent in five years' time. That's what the people did. All it took was just people's movement. No great investments, no great infrastructure, nothing. Just people's movement. We convinced the farmers to plant ten percent of their land into trees, fruit trees, any kind of tree. Just doing this, this much has happened. So another hundred million trees, people think it's big numbers. These are not big numbers. When I said, 114 million trees, they said, oh, this is impossible, how can anybody do this? Then I asked them, actually I don't come from Tamil Nadu, I come from Karnataka. So I asked them, how many people are you? They said, uh, we are four people in the house, one is on the way, something like this. <laughs> I said, that's not it, how many Tamils are you? How many Tamil people? They said, we are about uh, 60 million people. I said, sixty million people, all of you plant one tree today. Take care of it for two years and plant one more. You have 114 million trees going, much more than that. This is all it takes. Even a beggar on the street can plant one tree, he'll have an office for himself. Hmm? He'll have an office building growing for himself in the next few years if he plants a tree, isn't it? That's a kind of very grassroot level moment we started and now it's picked up into huge momentum, huge. We have over fourteen hundred nurseries now running in Tamil Nadu, generating millions of saplings, school children, all kinds of people. Most people you never thought would be involved in ecological movement, that kind of people. Now slowly the bigger guns are slowly beginning to move in in the end. So this is not… for me, this is not ecology. For me, my interest is just life. I'm not interested in ecology, I'm not interested in economy, I'm not interested in any damn thing. I'm only interested in life, are you? And all these things are needed to make life happen. And I don't see how… you know, I, I, when I was at the economic forum this January at Davos, Somebody came and said, oh, you are that amazing tree planter? This man is a professor in the Harvard University. 
I said, no, I am not a tree planter. He said, no, no, you planted millions of trees. Yes, we did because it's needed but I am not a tree planter. <laughs> then he said, okay, what do you do? I said, I make people flower. <laughs> That's my work. <laughs> my essential work is that human life flowers. If human life has to flower, you need a economy, you need a ecology, you need everything that supports and sustains that. I don't see why we have divided all these things in our perception. Whatever is necessary for life must happen, isn't it? John Roberts, uh, NPP senior. Uh, I've been hearing what you're saying and I really appreciate your philosophies and I appreciate you coming to our school. Uh, as a school of public policy um, and seeing the momentum that you've been able to turn in your projects, what recommendations do you have? Because you do have the ears actually of policy makers from throughout Southeast Asia. So I think somewhat related to your question, sir, is what do you recommend from a governmental perspective that we can do to help further bring about the things that you are saying here and the things that we all are agreeing with you, I believe? Oh, uh, when we say governance, we need to understand that uh, a government uh, generally is not designed to run the nation in its entirety. It's the people who have to run the nation. Always it's been so. Governance is to just create an atmosphere where… So now uh, here you decide you drive on the left side of the street. If you don't… if the government does not decide this, that in this country we drive on the left side of the street, are you from America? You drive on the wrong side <laughs> So now you come and drive that way, I come from India and I drive another way, somebody comes and they drive in the middle. Now every day we would be clashing into each other. So governance is essentially to see that people in their pursuit of their well-being and whatever else they are doing, they are not clashing into each other. That's governance essential on all levels whether it's economics or social life, whatever, essentially you are seeing every individual in pursuit of his well-being does not clash into somebody else's well-being. That's all governance essentially is. But there may be situations in societies where sometimes a government has to step in and pump up a few things because uh, it is not happening the way it is supposed to happen. So these are all usually there must be timely and limited periods of time. Any long-term intervention from any government always leads to some kind of, uh, you know, situations. In different societies, these things may be decided and determined by those societies as it is necessary for them. There is no one common prescription, one common prescription. I think lot of policy makers, lot of people influenced by one successful culture trying to implement the same thing elsewhere, they have caused quite a bit of disasters and pain across the world, you know. And uh, that's one of the biggest pains of Asia right now is we are trying to implement what the Western society successfully did on our societies where it is not fitting into people's way of thinking and feeling and doing things and it's causing so much of struggle. Not because it's right or wrong, it is just a question of what works for us here. So, as policy makers, the main policy is just this, human well-being is a policy, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> That's all the policy is. All other policies should be around that. There's a single policy for any government, it must be the well-being of the citizens of that nation. Rest of the policy is only incidental and it could be changing every other day as long as we keep the basic well-being of the citizens as the main policy, other policies can keep on changing as situations change. But unfortunately we get identified with uh, policies and systems and ideologies and we forget all this nonsense we created only for human well-being, isn't it? So there is only one policy actually, human well-being, well-being of the life on this planet. That is the only policy. To fulfill that one policy, we may have to continuously evolve what we are doing. 
Coming to thinking out of box and for Asia and the current meltdown, I mean there are a variety of people from various parts of the world but let me say this, I'm not saying this with uh, any kind of identity from a nation or a region. But one thing is clear that a few hundred years ago or for example, about two hundred fifty years ago, Asia was the most vibrant economic and social situation on the planet. That's why every European ship risking their life, they wanted to come to India because it was the most vibrant economy on the planet. For whatever reasons, for multiple reasons, these things change. And it went down and almost twelve, fifteen generations of uh, very abject poverty happened and various structures and strengths of the society diminished over a period of time. All these things have happened. Once again they are trying to rejuvenate that but there are many, many missing links in that we have to work on many things which uh, unfortunately our policy makers are still grappling with. It's not that there is lack of understanding but there is lack of implementation for various reasons. But now the current meltdown, if you ask me, I don't know none of you are going to like this, it's a very good thing. For me it's a very good thing because the kind of economic structures we have created are simply unrealistic. Simply, simply unrealistic. If you go at this pace, see right now for example, if you take American economy as the ideal because that's the richest society on the planet, if you take that as the standard and if you provide that for seven billion people on this planet, I think we just have another thirty, forty years for extinction. Yes? Am I exaggerating? Am I exaggerating? There's only one man <laughs> So, somewhere, somewhere we have to reinvent the way to run an economy that it's not self-destructive in the process of creating prosperity. Prosperity at what cost is something we have to look at. So one thing is definitely to relook at the very idea of what is development. We re really have to look at this. The very idea of prosperity is something we have to look at. Prosperity does not necessarily mean simply more, more, more and more, okay? Because there is no more, more and more and more. There is only this much. There is only one planet to live on. I know some of some the ladies are planning to export the men to Mars and uh, <laughs> wherever else but <laughs> there is actually right now only one plan. There is no endless more, there is only that much. How? To generate well-being for everybody within this, we have to completely rethink our ideas of well-being, our ideas of prosperity, our ideas of success in the world. If uh, I think meltdown has brought that kind of thought process in the world to some extent. But once again they are all getting hyped up because the share markets are moving up. <laughs> Even large companies, I know I have been interacting with them very closely, very large companies which are almost like small nations by themselves. In fact, their uh, annual turnovers are bigger than the budgets of many nations. Even such companies unfortunately are still operating from quarterly, bud uh, quarterly balance sheet to quarterly balance sheet. This is a very poor way of looking at life. You want to be ahead in the next quarterly balance sheet, it's, it's just uh, very disturbing that leaders who are, you know, who… When I go to Daos, I just look at these people, a little over two thousand people they control more than eighty percent of the world's economy and they don't have to be desperate about the next quarterly balance sheet. That's not the way to look at life. It needs to be looked little more long term. Beyond our life we have to look at the well-being, isn't it? We are living here as if we are the last generation. That's not good. 
So the kind of well-being that we had known in this part of the world, in this region in the world was of a totally different kind in the past. Only thing was the democratic process was missing to some extent. Other than that, generally people lived well. Even when monarchies were there, many of them were very gentle monarchies which handled things well, you know. People were happy. That's all that ultimately matters. People were happy. That's all that matters. Not this system or that system. There's no ideal system on the planet. Who is managing the system? That's what makes the difference, isn't it? Yes? Any system can be made to work beautifully if the right kind of people are handling it. The wrong kind of people, you give it whatever great systems in their hands, they will ruin it. So, we need to first of all focus on producing the right kind of people who have a larger vision of life than a very narrow focus towards a very narrow goal which is very, very destructive. So, meltdown is a good opportunity. One thing is to rethink many things and also no matter what you do, Asia never had a level playing field for various reasons. For the first time, there is a possibility that there could be a level playing field if you make use of this situation properly. Not against somebody, but if general well-being on the planet has to happen, there definitely needs to be a much more level playing field. Otherwise, it will just lead to continuous processes of exploitation which has been happening all the time. Initially it was Asia, now everybody's focus is on Africa. People are not interested in the African people. They are only interested in the African wealth. That's not a good way to approach any space. Because today it will be on somebody, tomorrow it will shift to somebody else the focus. Yes? So our way of structuring economies in the world has to come… You know, if you want to create a more gentler economies, more compassionate economies where every human being can find a way through it, not be rubbed down by it. It's very, very important that the public policy comes from a different level of understanding. Market forces are fine to keep vibrance in the economy, but market forces should not direct the nature of life on the planet because commercial forces should not direct the life on the planet, the nature of life on the planet. They are good only to keep vibrancy in activity and that's all. But right now we are allowing the commercial forces to decide how people live. Yes? I mean, I'm not making any particular comment on any company or whatever, but even a kindergarten child, a child which is going to kindergarten knows this much, that carbon dioxide is bad for him. Yes? But you bottle carbon dioxide and you say this is the real thing. <laughs> now we need to look at it. What is it? What is this about? Are we really interested in human well-being or just in somehow running something we call as economy which is against human well-being? There is no such thing. Nobody should call himself an economist, an environmentalist, this, this, this. Essentially every human being should be focused towards how to create well-being for all life on this planet. That should be the fundamental policy. And uh, this consciousness, if it doesn't arise on all levels, uh, we will work towards our, you know, diminishing human life on the planet, not for the well-being because Right now we are going about as if we are the last generation. It's a very irresponsible way to live. So this meltdown is a good time. People have time to think <laughs> because they're out of their jobs, they're thinking, you know, it's good. <laughs> uh, welcome you all to… We have created a certain space in South India, we are in the middle of a rainforest and uh, this space was essentially structured, engineered to… Uh, for self-transformation. This is a very carefully crafted place just for this purpose and we are open seven days of the week and 365 days and we are only four hours away from here. So someday, whenever it's possible for you, please make this trip and experience this space because this is a very, very unique space 
created for self-transformation. This is something that everybody should experience. Thank you very much.